saying. So I just got to check and see who he's actually talking about. <laughs> you, you know what's funny is that I have. I, I've actually, my dad started the ministry up there as a pastor in Chicago, so I've actually been there 50 years. And it seems like it just started. So I don't feel like I've been there 50 years. I feel, when I came, when we when started, I was 25, it starts taking over. And, and um, now I'm 61, so something happened along the way. And I was always looked at as the young guy that entered this, and I still keep looking at myself that way, but I'm not, I guess. So maybe I should look in the mirror more often and see what's looking back at me, I'm not sure. Uh, but it's kind of interesting to see what happens through the years. And if you've been in, in ministry or just life in general, you realize that there's an awful lot of stuff in life that goes on that is hard to deal with. There's stuff that's hard to understand. There's stuff that, um, even if you do everything right in this life, there's things that happen that you shake your head at. And that's what we're going to talk about, is this peace that God offers us regardless of the circumstances. Is it real? Is it really there? Can you have it? Is it something that you earn? Where does it come from? One of the, the most important things that I, I want to deal with is just our honesty and how we actually do feel about things because that's important to win the peace. It's one thing to win the war, it's another to win the peace. And you can hear legislators talk about that as well. It's, it's living in a way where the war doesn't distract you from the important things of life that God gave you to enjoy anyway. Let me pray. Father, again, thank you that we could meet. We ask that your spirit speak to our hearts during this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I have been uh, working with, um, so we're trans all those years, and we, we have all kinds of different, different divisions. And our latest one is called Relate365.com, where... We are actually trying to work with people on just the relationship skills. Even the workers, the young workers coming up out of high school and college, you know, they can have all the skill in the world for doing something, but they lack relational skills. Uh, the electronic world in which they're coming from and stuff doesn't promote relationships. And so we find that we have to really keep focusing on relationships, relationships, relationships. What are they? What are, starts with a relationship with God and goes to a relationship with people, and they need to be healthy. It's very important that we understand that. Sorry, I'm getting a cramp over here. It's really hard to talk with a cramp in here. It, 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 That look good on camera. Yeah. <laughs> now, you know, it's really important. In the Relate 365 stuff, one of the things that we came up with, the guy came and said, if you could summarize life very simply, I said I already did, the Silver Bertrand motto is really a focus for me. It's to know Christ, to make him known. All right, well, can you summarize it in shorter words? That's pretty short. How about this? Enjoy God. Enjoy people. How about that? Can we do that? I want to enjoy God and I want to enjoy people. How do we do that? That's the question. How do I enjoy God and enjoy people? The lack of peace, or peace is the opposite of something. It's the opposite of confusion. When you're confused, you can't be at peace. Have you ever been confused? You're looking at something going, I don't get it. I don't get it. That's not peace. It's the opposite of peace. When you're confused, the whole world is out of sync. How can you live your life and not be confused is the question. Because if you can live your life and have everything the way it's supposed to be, things can happen. My dad used to coin a phrase. He called it the faith rest life. In other words, he said those people who have faith, they have a life in, in the middle of the battle where they can rest in their life. And it's called the faith rest life. Now he was a guy who did amazing things. He was the first employee for Awana. He started it. He wrote all their books. He did all that. Started an inner city school. Started two camps in our state. I mean, you can go through and, and have a list of stuff that this guy did. 
And it's amazing when you look at it, what he accomplished. In the midst of it, I can't even imagine now the stresses he went under starting all these ministries and running them. Did you ever notice that if somebody's in charge of something, everybody can do their job better? Now, if you haven't understood that, I'm telling you that's the way it really is. Whoever's in charge of something, everybody can do your job better. That's under you. Everyone in the church can do the pastor's job better normally. Uh, everyone in a business can do the owner's job better. Everyone in the country can do President Trump's job better. I, I mean, when it gets right down to it, we'd say we don't want their job or whatever, but everybody can do it better. It's a really tough thing to be in charge of something and to start something. When you're starting something, you're starting something from nothing. And so there's a lot of people who can give you advice, but nobody wants to work. Because you have to start things and fail. My dad started so many things, I look back on his life and I go, what was this man thinking? But he had this faith rest life thing that he worked off of. He was a guy who, who honestly, in the midst of the rough seas that he was on, was at peace and enjoyed the journey. How did he get there? That's the question. And why did he coin this phrase? Well, two things that everybody looks for is significance and security in life. And no matter who you are, those are two things that you're going to see. You're going to want to know that your life wasn't a mistake. And you're going to want to know once it's not a mistake that it actually has some value that there's no way that it can be taken away from you. The things that really destroy peace are ritualism and legalism and religion. Now, ritualism is just doing something out of habit. You don't even know why you're doing it. It's just doing it. Legalism is almost the same. Not quite, though. There's a bunch of rules you keep. And, and if you keep those rules, then this is what happens. For example, I was just talking to one of you in between. It was like, you know, if, if God says this. If you love me, finish it for me. Keep my commandments. He doesn't say, if you keep my commandments, you love me. Legalists have that verse mixed up. See, they go the opposite way. I can act married even if I'm single and not be married. I can act single if I'm married and be married. But since I'm married, I should act married. See, that, that's not legalism if I'm married and I act married. Legalism is when we start putting the rules and then we think we accomplished something because of the rules. No, it's really hard to battle because you're going to do that. You're going to do the rules probably. I'm going to act married. Because I am. But just because I act married doesn't make me married. I hope that makes sense. Yeah. These are the things you have to look at and say, okay, these things, if these are prevalent in my life. Religion is, is man, let, let's do something to appease God, that, whatever it is, stand up, sit down, you know, whatever. That ritualism is just habits of doing things, and we think we've got the habits, we do it right. You're never at peace if these things are in control. You never, why? Because you never know if you acted right. You never know if you did it enough. You're not sure, you know, how good is good enough? How much, until I, you know, how much good do, do I have to accomplish before God taps me on and says, you're a good boy? It was never going to happen that way. I want to go to the word adoption. Adoption is one of the key concepts that are in the Bible that, that, un, that explains the relationship between God and me. Now, when you think of adoption, it's a simple process in one way, and it's complicated in another. It's simple for me, the one getting adopted. It's complicated for God, the one doing the adopting. It's not costly to me, the guy getting adopted. It's costly to God, the one doing the adoption. See, and, and you go through the picture all you want there. It's funny when Nicodemus comes to Jesus in chapter John chapter 3, and, and by the way, Jesus is just showing that he knows everything because Nicodemus doesn't ask him the question, but he answers a question he never asks, which is very interesting in the first place, which we don't talk about a lot, but it's cool. Nicodemus comes and goes, I know you're a teacher sent from God. He goes, you need to be born again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, but I, um, um, how did you know I was going to ask that? Well, he didn't even say that. He was totally confused. Why was Nicodemus confused? Religion, ritual, I mean, that stuff. Uh, I mean, he was confused because of that. So he's going, I don't get it. And I go inside my mouth. See, he went right to the rules. 
all right, we're going to see if God says you've got to be born again, and you've got to climb in back to another and get born again. And Jesus is going, Phew! nut job. <laughs> he didn't say that. I'm saying that, if I... But Jesus threw this born again phrase out, which is significant. See, when you're born physically, and he goes and explains it, you know, you have a time when you're born. There's April 7th, 1956, when I was born. When I was born. There was a time in history where I was born spiritually. Boom, right there. I remember it. I remember it. I was seven years old. I was seven years old, and I understood something. I was at a youth meeting, an Awana Club meeting. I was there a year early because my dad had pulled. And I was there when I shouldn't have been. I should have been eight, but I was there when I was seven. And I was listening to a guy named Don Schoff speak. Yeah, listening to a guy, Don Schoff. Yeah, no, that's Don Shire. Wrong one. Wrong Don. But Don Schoff, yeah, Don's my age. I wouldn't be listening to him speak. <laughs> <laughs> and Don Schoff gave the gospel. I went home and I talked to my dad about it. And we sat in his little, where his office was, and we, he re-explained things to me. And I understood I was a sinful guy that God loved, and that he sent Jesus to pay for my sins. At seven years old, bam, I became born again. I'm in God's family. Not because of my great wondrous works, not because I was a good guy, not because of anything else, except for I understood my need. And I understood that God loved me and would provide for my need. And he did. That was it. See, adoption, when you think about it, I have a friend who adopted a little girl from Africa. His one of his other children went on a website and found this girl and said, Dad, I think we should adopt this one. This one was listed with certain disabilities and that kind of thing. Dad, I just think we should. What did this girl offer that family? Nothing. Nothing. She offered that family neediness. She was in another country. She had no parents. She had nobody to care for. Nobody wanted her. She was on a list of people that people shouldn't get. She, was, she offered nothing. So what did this family do? They offered the money, the time, the airplane ride, the house, everything this person needed to become part of the family. They offered it. What did she have to do? Say yes. She had to offer her neediness. You know what, I can do that. That I can do. Be perfect, can't do. Keep all the rules, can't do that. But I could offer my neediness. Now, I, this girl is one who's growing up, and I'm watching her grow up, and I've been around her. And, you know, she, she doesn't always behave. But she's still in that family. Because it wasn't up to her as to why she was in that family. She just said yes. You have to understand that we're in a relationship with God that is an adoptive relationship. You have to get that. And everybody in this room, you fall into only one of two categories. You are either in God's family or you're not. You're not working your way in. You're not hopefully one day going to be in. You are either in God's family or you're not. Now, if you're not in God's family, immediately, that is the reason why there's no peace in your life. You can't be at peace with God and not be in His family. You can't live a life apart from God when you were created to live with God and for God and to show people who God is. So there's no possible way for you to be at peace apart from that. So, so for those in the room that have never really understood that the only thing you give to God is your neediness, your, 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 your effort is worthless in that case. You come to God and you say, I have nothing. I offer you nothing. I have nothing. That's just fine. I've got it. I can cover it. My son died for you. Those who are believers, see, you are the ones that have the capability that are in God's family. You now have the capability to enjoy the fact that God Almighty, the God of the universe, is your Father. And, and theologically, what is the limitations of God? Zero. Zero limitations. He controls everything. Yep. And he loves you. Uh -huh. 
And you can approach him anytime you want, right? You can talk to him about anything you want. Correct. Anytime you want. Right. He can cover for you. Exactly. He can manipulate the universe for you. He could. I don't know if he will, but he could. He only does what's right. Exactly. So the question I would have is, for those of us who don't live in peace, what category are you in first? Because not living in peace indicates something. It indicates either that you are not capable of it because you're not a child of God, or it indicates that you're not enjoying God or walking with Him and understanding the grace that He offers you. One of the two. Because the lack of peace is not a fruit of the Spirit. Those who follow Christ will fall into all sorts of trials and tribulations. There is no possible way for me to stand up here and tell you that those who follow Jesus will not go through this, will, will not experience the same trials and troubles that everyone else faces. I mean, I was just having a cramp in a weird spot. <laughs> Why? I am trying to do something nice. <laughs> I don't know. Circumstances are right to get cramps in weird spots. You know, as I stand before you right now, I'm a guy that, when I was a kid, was in a wheelchair. I got cut from a no-cut baseball team. That's how bad it was. <clears throat> a lot of things have happened in my life. As I stand before you now, I've been diagnosed with heart problems, heart attacks, I've had pulmonary embolisms, and I am a narcolip. I am not somebody you should follow if you want to be healthy. You know, as I look at all those things, I'm totally at peace with all of them. Because all of those things are in the hand of my Father. Right now, here's what I know for sure. My Heavenly Father, He can cure me of all those things if He wants to. By the word of His mouth, I don't have them anymore. Yeah. But He chooses not to for some reason. That doesn't change anything about God. So I'm at peace. There's a plan for these things, whether I like them or not. I used to call this, um, for those who heard me speak before, I'm sorry I repeat myself because I'm getting in that age bracket where I get to. <laughs> <laughs> but I call it jigsaw puzzle theology. I hate jigsaw puzzles. I hate them. You, you know something about my personality by me saying that because here's my thought process. Why would you take a perfectly good picture, cut it into a thousand pieces and ask me to put it back together? <laughs> it was already together. This seems like a waste of time to me. <laughs> I understand. Those of you that love them, enjoy them. But you know what would be worse is if you handed me a puzzle and I had no idea how many pieces were in the first place. And I didn't have a cover. And you tell me to put it together and enjoy it. I mean, I don't know where I'm going with these pieces. I mean, I'll find the edge pieces, I'm sure. And we'll go from there. You know what I've realized in life is that God has given me a puzzle. But he's got the cover. And I get these pieces, and I, half the time I don't know where they go. In my brain, right or wrong, I have all the pieces that are not in place yet over on this side. I'm waiting for things to happen in life so I can slide them over. Because here's what I promise you, when I get to heaven, he can flip that cover over and say, that's how it fits. That's what brings me peace. Not the fact that I have pieces I can't figure out. Because there are pieces I can't figure out at this point. I am going to have the same struggles, the narcoleptic struggles, the physical struggles, the trials. I am going to have the same trials that everybody else experiences as a child of God. The difference is whom I'm trusting through the trials. You ever remember that, that God tells us that when we grieve, we don't grieve as those that are without hope. It didn't say you won't grieve. It says you don't grieve as those without hope. See, that's different. 
when my dad died, it was the single worst day of my life. I love my dad. He was my hero. I was in my 30s already, and I was still saying that about him. And he had a heart attack and left. I was mad. I went to the funeral, obviously. And before everyone came in, my brother was in there. He goes, Dave, you need to come in and see Dad's body. And I said, no, I'm not doing that. I'm not looking at him, Dad. There's no way. Smart guy I was. I said, I'm not doing it. Excuse me, Rick. Right now, I'm a little mad at God. I'm a little mad at you. And anyone else who walks around, I'm going to be mad at, if you don't mind. I had no peace whatsoever, none. My brother is my older brother, and I've always been actually a submissive young brother. Personality, not don't have me on the back. I'm a compliant person by, by nature. So my brother forced me to go see my dad. I remember walking up and looking at that casket. And as I looked in the casket, I want to tell you something I learned. The greatest peace that I've ever experienced came over me, mixed with the greatest sorrow I've ever felt. And for the first time in my life, I realized that they aren't exclusive. I had misinterpreted, I had misunderstood what peace was. I always thought peace was kicking out the bad stuff, not having feelings that are bad and not feeling bad. I thought peace came from Getting rid of that, it didn't. It came from the addition of putting it in the context of a heavenly body. As I stood and looked at my dad, verses came to my head. I heard him talking, not God, but my dad, in my head. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And I had the greatest peace in the middle of the greatest sorrow. All at the same time. And I said, God, forgive me for all my life. I have misinterpreted. Think about how many people right now are trying to gain peace by going to get drunk or doing something else or by getting rid of the, the feelings. Look. Some little girl get abused. You shouldn't get rid of the feelings of anger and outrage. You shouldn't get rid of those. There are things in life that you shouldn't get rid of the feelings for. But the feelings, see, feelings don't direct us. Oh, they're there. They should be acknowledged. The danger in the evangelical world are the people who have feelings and pretend they are not there. And then they walk in and say, oh yeah, everything's just great. I feel great. What we need to say is, this stinks. But God is good. When a young person comes to me and they've experienced uh, something that I went through with the loss of my dad, and it's sudden, and they come and talk to me, almost my first phrase out of my mouth is, that stinks. That's terrible. Yes, I know, I know. I, I shouldn't be a pastor that goes to bedside man or stuff. I, I understand that. But then I talked to him about the hope that he had. Excuse me, I'm getting that cramp again. <laughs> then I talked to him about the hope that we have. I never ask him to get rid of the pain. Like, because when you love somebody, you're going to live in pain, I'm sorry. There's no possible way to love somebody and not be in pain. There's no way that you can watch somebody you care about make bad decisions, get sick, do things, and go, oh, good. I'm really happy that life is crummy right now. There's no possible way to do that. I think what we have to do is acknowledge and own the pain, and at the same time acknowledge the fact that we live in a broken world and that God has died, sent his son to die to rescue us from that. And the grace of God that passes all the understanding of life, the position that we have as a child of God, will guide us through those dark times so that, in the end, we can experience the ultimate victory. And the ultimate victory is really peace with God. 
The, the, the God of peace brings peace to me, to you. Colossians 1.20, and through him to reconcile to himself all things. All things. Look, death is a hard thing, and the transient of life and falling apart in life, those are tough things to go through because we weren't originally meant to go through them. Like cramps. <laughs> I know this is silly. We weren't meant to go through them. We were not meant to. Sin is what caused death. Death is separation. Can I share something with you just between you and me and anyone else who watches this in the world? <laughs> the day my wife and I have to be separated, I'm not looking forward. Mm -mm. I'm going to be okay. Because I'm going first. No. <laughs> <laughs> Even if I don't go first. And I want her to be okay by the way. She'll be sad. I'll be sad. But we can be at peace. Because this isn't the final stop. Hebrews 7.25, consequently he is able to do and save to the uttermost those who draw near to him. Now I can draw near to God. When you see the word saved in the Bible, it isn't always talking about from hell. It's saved from an array of things. You can be saved from a faithless life. There's a benefit, obviously, to be one of faith that has their faith in God. There's a peace that passes understanding that comes. See, it passes understanding. So when you're trying to put it in the realm of understanding, does it work? It doesn't work, so just admit it. It doesn't work. I'm trying to understand this, God. It doesn't work. Right, he said, I can only give you a peace that passes that. Yeah, but God, I think my peace has to be connected to my understanding. Well, then you are very limited in what would give you peace. Yeah, I guess so. Romans 5, 1, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God. When I stand before God, I, I'm already thinking, you know, God, I've failed so many times. And I can already hear God and my Father say, you know, it's good I didn't put you in my family because you were perfect. Oh, yeah, that's right. I have peace with you, don't I? You do? I'm your Father. And if you're waiting to be perfect for me to be pleased with you, I know it's not going to happen. What is it? The Eurem and Edmund, who I mentioned earlier, has a saying, he said this, never doubt in the dark what God taught you in the light. I am firmly convinced that God works in our lives during the good times to prepare us for the times that we have to go through. Here's the problem. If during those good times you're ignoring God, you will not be prepared for the bad times. Since I was talking about my father and his death, let me tell you what happened going up to it. And forgive me if you've heard it. Before he died, about two weeks before he died, for some reason I was obsessed with the idea of death and what happened to a Christian when they died. I've been teaching just like I am now, and I was teaching, and I started to teach about death, and God through death, and all that stuff. And I couldn't get it off my mind. I kept thinking about, yeah, but why is this, why am I possessed by this? I want to know what happens to somebody when they die, etc. I had, a, I had a, three friends come and visit me. One of them came, and, and, and he was talking to me, he was talking about two children that he lost, that died early in life. One at birth, and one at a little bit after birth, and, and just was talking about it randomly. Another friend who came and talked to me, my best friend of years ago, I decided to turn his back on God. He was down in Chicago, and, and he, uh, he was picking up somebody that he was having an affair with, and a guy's husband came out and put a gun to his head a little more. And he came and talked to me, the friend of his, another friend of ours came and reminded me of this. And, and I thought, you know, God, it, I'm thinking about death, and now i got these two, kid, two kids that, that he came and shared with my buddy who got blown away. And, and that, 
that, that it was a Sunday morning, uh, the, the Sunday before, the, not a, a week and one day later, my dad would die. And it was Sunday morning that um, I came out of my house and I was, I was uh, going to take the garbage out before we went to church and this car pulls up in my driveway at 7.30 in the morning. And I looked and it was a guy I knew and he was from Chicago. And I looked, and I was six hours away. And I said, what are you doing here? And he goes, I don't know. His son had gone to school, Baylor. He was in the nursing program. His son was our head of our dish crew at camp for years and went through the church, youth groups, all that stuff, they got all the awards. But he had a homosexual encounter while he was in college. He contracted AIDS and he died. Before he died, he had called my dad because he was confused about life. And my dad had talked to him about his position with Christ. And he had repented and he was living right. And my dad said, why don't you come up to camp this summer and do dishes again? And he invited him back so he could talk to the kids that were there and say, don't, don't waste what happened in lunch. You made some mistakes. Let's, let's use it. Let's use it to build a kingdom. My dad was a conservative guy, by the way, in the day when AIDS was just coming out of it. You can imagine. But he never made it, he died. So this was his dad that was in my driveway. And he didn't know why he was there. I said, can you come in for a cup of coffee? He goes, no. I think I'll just say hi and be on my way. <laughs> okay. 12 hour drive to say hi. That night, I, I pulled out a piece of paper, and I started to write a poem. Uh, I'm a hockey player, and football player. Poems don't come easy. I don't even think I know anyone who writes poetry. <laughs> but I started to write a poem. But I couldn't finish it. It was about that. And what God's view of it, it was. A week later, when I got home after being with my mom when my dad died. I was at my in-laws house. I'd been down there for a board meeting on Saturday and my dad was in the board meeting. Sunday I heard him preach his last message. And Monday he died. When I got home that night, I to my in-laws, I pulled out that poem and finished it. I share this with you because I thought at that moment, God, what if during the last two weeks I've been busy and not listening to you? I wouldn't have been prepared for this moment that you tried to prepare me for. God knew he's my father. He knew that I would struggle with him taking my death. He knew that. So he wanted to prepare me for it. That's how kind he is. For all of you, there's light times in your life. There's light. It's those times where you need to enjoy God's word, live in God's word, apply God's word, because there's dark days coming. And don't you doubt in the dark what you learned in the light. Don't do that. It's easy to doubt in the dark. Isaiah 26, 3, you will keep him in perfect me peace. Who? Whose mind is stayed on you. That's where you keep him perfect peace. Not whose mind is stayed on the circumstances. Not whose mind is stayed on, on, on the details of life that drive us nuts. You will stay in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you, on God. Remember the ticks up a little bit. It's those who think I'm God. Don't be anxious about anything. Look, there's a lot to be anxious about. No, 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 no. No, not really. Anything at all is under the control of Almighty God and He loves you. And, and sometimes if you're sitting and talking with me, I might ask you question, more questions than give you answers. If you're coming to me and you're struggling, I'd say, do you believe in God? And you'd probably say, yes. And say, well, this F that with him. Are we done? Dave, that didn't help. Oh. Well, what do you believe about God? Oh, I believe he's faithful. Well, then act that way. Wait a minute, Dave. This 
isn't healthy. What do you want me to tell you? That you don't believe what you say? Because that's what I'm hearing. You need to reconcile those things. If God is who you say he is, then you wouldn't be acting like you're acting. So you need to spend time acting in accordance with what you actually believe, and you need to check what you believe with the Bible to make sure it's accurate. Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer, supplication, with thanksgiving. See, the with thanksgiving part there. God, I know you're in charge. I know you love me. This isn't going bad. Let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, when you do that, that's when you get the peace. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding. I'm not asking you to live in a way, again, where you understand it. Then we know, this is what we know. We know that for those who love God, all things work together. Do you know that? Well, then live that way. Well, Dave, you're making this sound awful simple. It is. Really, it is. There's a bunch of verses. I would love for you to go to Hebrews, and I, I don't have time because I, I didn't mean to get into those stories that deep. But go to Hebrews and read it. Hebrews was really about the Jewish people, a bunch of laws and rules. But there was a new thing that took place. There's a relationship that superseded it. My dad loved to teach Hebrews. He got the faith for us life from the book of Hebrews. I have, I think, seven of his messages that I am now got electronically, actually, that he just labeled the faith for us life, and they all come from Hebrews. Like listening to Jay Vernon McGee, though, it's just tough. He's been gone a while. But the message hasn't changed. Let me just get a seat. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace. What we need to learn is how to approach God correctly. And that's with confidence. Enjoying the grace of God. Here's what we must put into perspective. God's mercy and God's grace are different. Mercy is not getting what you deserve. Grace is getting more than you deserve. Mercy, yes, he sent Jesus to die in your place. You deserve death in hell and separation from God. You don't get it. That's because of God's mercy. What about his grace? His grace gives you more than you deserve. That is 2, 11 to 13. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. And it teaches us. The grace does what? It teaches us to do what? To deny ungodliness and worldly lusts and to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. The grace of God teaches us that? I thought we used the grace of God like when we sin and we just don't want to get punished for it. No, the grace of God. Here's what that means. The grace of God means that Dave Wager is a child of the king. So I need that that way. See, I'm elevating my life to live as one who is a child of God. That's his grace. His grace is sufficient for me. The position I have is sufficient for me. The position as his child is sufficient for me. It's sufficient. No matter what happens in this life, His grace is sufficient. My position as a child of His is sufficient. I don't need to do what those who aren't in the family do. I have no concern for anything other than listening to my Father. Why? Because He will care for the rest of it. I, I really don't know how I'm going to end up with resources when I get old. If I, if I get old, I don't even know these things. But my father does. He immediately I go back to my position. My position of living in grace. 
My father knows. I can relax. My father knows. And he loves me. I just got to listen to him. And the peace that passes understanding. Notice still, I'm not pretending I like bunions. Or anything else that goes wrong in life. I'm saying that peace comes from the addition of living in the grace that God gives me. And grace is a position of child. I am a child of the king. There is nothing. There is a, a discussion once there's, believe it or not, there's some people that don't like me. <coughs> and uh, when you're on the radio and you have different things that go on, there's some people that would like to not see you around anymore. And so you do have threats from time to time. I've had places where I've gone where I've had to have um, the local law enforcement made sure they were there. You know what I really think, though? You want to get me, you got to go through my father. You can have all the stuff in the world, and i got a date put on me already. I'm not saying that that's not how I'm going to leave this world, but there's not anything that's going to happen that doesn't go through him first. He's the one I depend on, not the police force. Well, they can be there, and I'll submit to that. Kind of like somebody came to me once and said, so Dave, if you trust God, how much money should you have in the bank? I said, I don't know. He said, Dave, that's not what I'm looking for. So what percentage? I said, I don't know. I said, can I share something with you there? Sure. If you're trusting your money, you're an evil person. That's all. Dave, that didn't help. I'm not saying it should have. But you know what? No matter how much money you have, money can become evil if you start trusting it. You need to trust in God. And you might have a lot of money put away, a little money put away. It doesn't really matter if you're trusting it, you're evil. The issue isn't how much you need. The issue is, who are you trusting? What are you trusting? You know, my dad, when he died, he died at 60 years old. Guess who didn't have a retirement account? Guess whose God knew that he didn't need one? He wasn't going to be around to use it. Now, I don't know. I could look to be 150. I might need some money. I have no idea. See, that's not my issue. My issue is what do I trust? Because according to the grace of God, if I trust my position in Christ, I can be at peace. If I have to trust my religion and my, my duties and all that kind of stuff and be good enough, and I have to trust my own wisdom or my money or whatever, I'm probably not going to be at peace. I'll be confused as to what I'm supposed to do. I am not confused as to what I'm supposed to do. I'm not. I am supposed to trust my God. And narcolepsy or not, I need to trust my God. The peace, the puzzle box will be turned to me one day. And I have a feeling that if I can trust my God, that my Heavenly Father could be standing here with my earth and Paul. It can be a little nod. Nice work. We're proud of you. And that means something. Because God doesn't lie. And i got to understand that. Peace. It comes from living in the grace that God offers us. I hope you understand that. Father, again, thank you for the time together today. Thank you for your love and for your mercy and for your grace that we can live in every day. I pray your spirit speak to our hearts. Let us use peace as a barometer to where we're really at and what we're really focusing on. Draw our hearts to you first and foremost so that we can live in peace. In Jesus' name, amen.